sounds very current to me. I, I don't know about you, but I found this whole COVID-19 experience yeah. really curious because on a physical level, we haven't yeah. been able to enjoy community the way we used to. You know, we can't physically get together. Exactly. And we've been forced into this new way of communicating, which has had some disadvantages and some advantages. The advantages are that you can sit there with your glass of wine at 10 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> I can sit here with my cup of coffee in Singapore at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, yeah. and we can still enjoy a conversation together. Exactly. And, and the fact that we haven't seen each other for several years, um, and, and I mean, we can still pick up. So yeah. one of the, I think the idea of exploring community at this time is an incredibly interesting one. It's, and I think for all of us, <clears throat> many of us who felt lonely during lockdown periods, however it affected you, wherever you are, um, you know, it's made us think about what do we value in other people? What do we value in ourselves? Um, and it's interesting, in advance of this, you sent me a question. One of the questions you asked me is, <clears throat> who are you? And I thought, <laughs> wow, that's like a, who are you? That's like yeah. such an existential question. And I think if you'd asked me that question um, maybe six months ago, I would have said I'm fundamentally a storyteller. You know, I started my career in, mm. in TV um, and, and in public relations, writing mm -hmm. stories about technology. And I think now, actually, I wouldn't use that word. I would actually say I, I am a community builder. Um, I, at the end of the day, we build communities around activities, we build communities around ideas, we build communities around political movements, we build uh, communities around products, um, yeah. and we build them around places sometimes. And one of the things that human beings have always done is to tell stories to each other. So storytelling is sort of part of something bigger. Yeah. But if I think of, you know, what did I miss out on? Um, for anyone who watching who doesn't know, I, I had COVID-19. My wife and I both did, and I was in an isolation room for five days here in Singapore. Wow. Got fantastic care from Ministry of Health. So thank okay. you for that, uh, Ministry of Health. Um, but being on my own for, for five days, I was absolutely mm. cut off from physical community. And yet hundreds of people, you know, I, students I taught, companies I'd mentored, wrote to me. And that was incredibly um, moving. I mean, it really left me with a a feeling at the time in there in isolation thinking I don't want to lose this I don't want to lose this sense of what's important wow. uh, because what's really important is being part of something bigger than me mm -hmm. and I think that's if I come to the core of it that's what community is about you know we all face doubts about our own abilities we face challenges in our lives and hum fundamentally human beings are social animals we, we need to come together in communities if we deny that yeah we're denying part of ourselves But a community builder is someone who creates stories that bring people together. That story mm. could be, we are a co-working space, or it could be, we are all entrepreneurs, mm. or we are all women in tech. That's a story. So tell me a little bit about the stories you created to bring people together. Tell me a little bit about the communities you created. Sure. Well, if I go back to the beginning of my career, mm. I, I, I started my career as an engineer, and then I became um, uh, a TV producer. I trained at the BBC making science films. And the thing I was trying mm. to do there was, you know, this is in an age of broadcasting. This is sort mm. of like 1990, 1991. So um, okay. we didn't have the World Wide Web yet. Yeah. Um, and broadcasting was a, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say now, it was about us, the big people in London, talking to you, the little people at home. You know, and actually people tuning in, as we used to say, would actually want that. They would want an authoritative figure in the central position telling them what was going on. So like, I am yeah. a storyteller. My job is to entertain you, to make you laugh, to make you feel something. And if, I, and if you believe in me, you'll follow me. So there's a very sort of hierarchical view of it. Mm. What I found so interesting about, uh, so, the, so the communities I built were really around TV programs. If you think of you know, my job as a producer was to create shows that millions of people would tune into. Um, mm. When I started, the first show I worked on at the BBC had 10 million people viewing every week. Um, it was a live science show called Tomorrow's World that had been running for about 30 mm -hmm. years when I joined it. And that was a community. It was a community of people who were all interested in the future and saying, how is technology changing our future? Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, when I reflect on it, it was a community that believed that technology defined the future. And if you, if you look at the 1960s, whenever you see the future talked about, they always think of it in terms of technology. They don't think of it in terms of, you know, diverse lifestyle arrangements. They don't think, you know, the future would be about gay people having equal status to straight people, mm. whatever, you know, mm -hmm. that doesn't come into it. It's always about technology. Mm -hmm. The assumption is that society will stay the same and technology will move on. So curiously, that community was in its own way, very 
limited. Mm. I don't think if you were launching a science program now, you would do it in the same way. But each program I made, in a sense, created a community. If people watched television largely live at that time, yeah. there was video recording at home, but TV created an incredible sense of community. When I would go to school, friends would have watched the same show as me the night before, and we'd all talk about what was on the show. Now, that still happens around things like sport. Okay. You know, and I think I mean, sport, I've never worked in sport broadcasting, mm -hmm. but it's interesting how sport is absolutely a community, isn't it? It's, it's teams. It's about competition. It's about everything that happens in society, but done in a sort of yeah. small way. And I think when I look back at the other communities that I've created, so, uh, you know, around startups, for example, in Singapore, mm -hmm. right, with my co-founder, Wong Meng Wang, and thousands of people here, we, we built a community in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Meng and I uh, didn't uh, put ourselves at the center of that. We facilitated a community to come together. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing I've learned you know, when I was in broadcasting, it was me, the producer, writing a, a, a director, making a film, and you, the little people, are watching. You can't do that in a um, nowadays, mm. and and it's it feels wrong to do it. I'm kind of almost embarrassed that I was involved in that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's much more now about. It was a different world. It's a different world. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean over, when I joined the BBC, there were three words over the door. BBC was set up to inform educate and entertain that was its mission so i know i'm going to inform mm. you yep i'm the teacher you're going to be learning and educating you know i'm yeah. funny so you're going to be entertained <laughs> whereas i think if we were picking three words now for community building they would be about um connect share um contribute mm -hmm. things like that they wouldn't yeah. they wouldn't be informed it's in, way more be circ down circular things. than like unidirectional yeah. right before in marketing we would do ads i brand choose what to tell about me to you and you mm -hmm. believe me because you only have this channel but today everyone's talking online about everything yep. so it's more important that me as a brand deliver value to people in a way that i trust them to talk about me because they will talk and it's actually better if they do otherwise If you haven't read the Clue Train Manifesto, it's a fantastic piece of writing. It was written about 1990 by uh, a bunch of people who were very visionary at the time. You've got to remember this is before the World Wide Web. Um, and it's, it's, it's a political manifesto. And it basically says brands are conversations. You know, in the old world, you mm -hmm. created the conversation, you own the brand. And if people got messages about your brand wrong, you sued them, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the modern world, the world is going to talk about your brand. You can choose to enter that conversation, but you can't control it. So the interesting thing is that, you know, when we think of brands like McDonald's, I mean, in theory, or Coca-Cola, in theory that, you know, legally the Coca-Cola mm -hmm. trademark belongs to the Coca-Cola company, but mm -hmm. actually it only has meaning because we give it meaning. Mm -hmm. The same with Harvard or Yale or the BBC yeah. or American Airlines. None of these mm -hmm. brands mean anything unless we, the community, decide that they mean something. So it's actually, we, the community, it. own yeah. those brands, not, not the marketers. And that's a huge shift in mindset for companies that are used in the 20th century to controlling the discussion and controlling, this is my brand positioning. You know, yeah. it doesn't work like that anymore. Community is when people are in touch with each other. So what you've mentioned is that you would go to school and talk about those TV programs. So it's like community gives you not only the platform, but the preempted conversations, right? The reason, the excuse is to talk about something. So what does actually define if it is a community or just a crowd for you? I think a, a, a crowd, you, um, a crowd you're part of, but um, you're not mm. really defining, you're not, you're not anything within it. In a mm. community, people start to put themselves into roles, don't they? So one mm. of the things I found very interesting building JFDI as a community was that we, we realized that you know, everyone was looking for a role. Um, mm. We used to have a, the sign on the wall, the Steve Jobs piece about, um, uh, about misfits, you know, um, yep. and how um, the world is created by, I can't remember, how does, this, how does it start? Um, but I think that you know, the interesting thing about, say, a community around a football team is it's very formalized, it's very clear. There are rules for playing football and everyone has a set of expectations about how a football team works. So mm. you can be a player, you can be a manager, you can be a coach, you can be a supporter, you can okay. be a kind of slightly um, adversarial fan that puts 
comments online and, and comments mm -hmm. about the manager and things like that. There are different sort of roles and everyone kind of knows what role to play. One of the interesting things about JFDI when we were putting that together is that entrepreneurship was relatively new to Singapore and Southeast Asia at the time. And there were a lot of people who were kind of interested in it for various reasons, some to make money, some to become themselves, some to get their ideas made, some to meet other people. There were lots of people who gathered around us and they were all interested in finding a role. Mm. Um, and so I think to me, that's the difference. You know, a community actually does have roles. And one of the interesting things about starting a community in a real sort of frontier space is that there are no rules. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's another kind of example, but I was, I was interviewing a bunch of um, multinationals recently about how um, this COVID-19 period had changed the way they communicate when they create mm. little temporary communities. If you create a, uh, a conference call with 15, 20 people in it, you're creating a little community for a moment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that one of the Western uh, chief executives of a very large multinational said to me was that he said it was fascinating the way that the younger Asian participants in these uh, conference calls he'd had were speaking up and challenging the more senior people in a mm -hmm. way that they would not do face to face. You know, traditionally, um, you know, Asian culture tends to have, on average, a higher power distance, as people like Geert Hochstetter would say. Um, it's more hierarchical. Yep. That's just the way the culture is. So mm -hmm. in a face-to-face -face setting, everyone has an expectation, this is the way I behave. When you have a new situation, like the first time a board meeting is held online, then there are no rules. And so everyone has to find their role, and they can, um, and, 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 and that was what happened with JFDI when we were setting up, you know, the first real sort of startup community in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, um, everyone was trying to figure out, well, who am I here? What do mm -hmm. I, what's my, what can I say? What am I allowed to do? What will other people mm -hmm. respond to me? So there's this interesting thing that I think, you know, all of us in life are, are trying to solve three fundamental problems in the, in the beginning of our lives. The first half of life, this is, this comes from a guy called Richard Raw. He, you know, he says, we, mm -hmm. we're trying to solve the problem of survival. How do we feed ourselves? Mm -hmm. We're trying to solve the problem of who do I spend my life with? Maybe mm -hmm. find a life partner. And the third thing we're trying to solve is, who am I? What's my identity? The very mm. first question you ask me. And we can only really define our identity in terms of other people. In relation to you know, others. In, in, in relation to others. Our, our identity in the absence of others means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need other people. We need the community. Otherwise, we don't know who we are. We lose a sense of purpose. We lose all our bearings. Mm -hmm. So you want in a community the curious thing is you want people that you hate <laughs> you want people that are totally different to you you want people that you're inspired by and you think oh i could never get there you want all of those people um Interesting. and and that, that's what a real really rich community is all about i think so we're all still looking to belong either in a startup community or in a consumer brand community wherever or in a family in in a place with someone we love we need mm. that to define who we are and even to survive as a biological mm. instinct mm. but what do you think has changed for communities to be so spoken about right now because i've been listening about community building more now than ever so why now why is it different while it has been there since 300,000 years ago. Sure. I, my hunch is, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but I think it's because mm -hmm. um, we have some changes in society to do with technology about the way that we connect with each other. Again, it's, I was trying to explain to my son, who's just come up to 14, when mm -hmm. I was a kid, um, we had a black and white TV set in the corner of the room, and we had some one magazine, like the TV listings magazine that came every week, and there was a telephone. But there was no, if we wanted to publish something, if we wanted to connect with other people, the only way to get to other people was to persuade local shop owners to put a poster in the window. Mm -hmm. And then you would get physically get people together. You know, on a Monday evening, on the 7th of January, we're all going to meet at this place. And physical community was the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about universities, we still have a campus concept because it's about people physically coming together. Yeah. Um, through the 20th century, which was about mass communication, one to many broadcasting, then the model of the new model of community then was about a centralized hierarchy projected down through yeah. broadcasting and other mass media. The, the, what we have now is a completely um, democratized cacophony of, of mm. communities 
which I think is very confusing and very creative. And so it's not surprising that we've got all these debates, for example, around free speech. So there are some people who passionately believe that however offensive it is, what you're saying, that you should have the right to say it. There are other people, you know, I live here in Singapore where the government takes the view, we, we cannot tolerate racism. We, mm -hmm. we, you cannot have someone coming out with a load of racist stuff in public here on this little island. It mm -hmm. would just be absolutely destructive to our country. So mm -hmm. the view that Singapore takes is that free speech is limited. Now, there are other people, of course, who think that free speech, by definition, must be unlimited. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can argue both ways on that. So yeah. I think that we, what technology has made possible is new kinds of connections. And that leaves us all tragically unprepared. When in my famous, my most, sorry, my most uh, favorite quote of all time comes from the biologist E.O. Wilson. Uh, and he said something like, and I'll, I'll get the quote mm -hmm. slightly wrong, but he said something like, in the tragedy of humanity, is that we have godlike technology, medieval institutions, and Paleolithic emotions. You know, we're basically still inside in terms of our evolution. We're still hunter-gatherers of Stone Age people. Yes. The way that we organize ourselves is like Game of Thrones, and yeah. yet we have the ability to destroy the world and to talk instantly around the world. And this, this call is costing you and me absolutely nothing. And that is total science fiction. When I was a kid, the idea that I would have multiple computers in my lives and I could talk to you for free on video that's across insane. the world if you yeah. told me that if you told me that when i was my son's age 40 years ago i'd never have believed you yeah <laughs> it so is I incredible i love I think... that quote by the way that 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 makes so much sense and also we are we're like children playing with our own tech and we do not know yet the impact yes. of it yeah. and we went yeah. in 50 the... years from living in the countryside where i'm back in the countryside right now but it is an option mm -hmm. and i'm connected with you mm -hmm. in singapore from the countryside of brazil but before I was stuck in one village and I had to be there and I had that community around me, but mm -hmm. this is the, the disadvantage of it was if I was maybe different from my community, like if I had a different sexual orientation or different yeah. ethnicity, I yeah, might yeah. have suffered a little bit more than today. I go to a big city and there's a lot of diversity. So self-expression has gained a lot of space and that's great. But on the flip side, we see this, how can I say, the revenge of intolerance. And yes. I, 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 I think this is a very long discussion, but essentially we have the opportunity to create new communities through tech mm. yeah. where everyone belongs. And it's, but, and it's really yeah. complicated and hard because mm. I was thinking the first time I did some work in the Middle East, you know, I was thinking about cultures like Bedouin culture. You know, mm -hmm. if you are a tribe of a small group of people traveling through the desert. The reason that you have really quite brutal laws um, is because if someone is disruptive to the group and creates disharmony and steals something from someone else, and then there is an argument, everyone's going to die. Right? <laughs> when, when, you know, if you're, a if you're, if you're, you depend on each other so much that you have to have an absolutely strict. kind of rock solid set of expectations. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just not going to survive. Um, you can't just go inventing new things every day <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because you're up against survival is difficult. So I think we, you know, there's very good reasons why in traditional societies mm. things are the way they are, and people have the roles they do. And there is a doctor in the village, and there is a priest in the village, mm -hmm. and there is a wise old man and a wise old woman. And there are young children who are learning and there is a schoolmaster and there's a bunch of different roles, you know, in a traditional village. Yeah. Yeah. And they're there because that's what the village needed to survive. The, the sort of challenge for us all now, I think, and, uh, and, and by the way, and in that situation, I think that brands through the 20th century were able to come in and do marketing and say, what's unsatisfactory about this traditional setup mm. and how can, um, how can um, uh, we come in and give people a desire that they, um, that they um, that they maybe don't have already. In a traditional culture, yeah. there are all sorts of unsatisfied needs. Mm. And traditionally, marketing comes in and says, "Hey, you know, would you like to do this if you join with this brand?" You know, whatever. Mm. So you get things like rock and roll. You know, which in the 1950s, it was not rock and roll was a whole community in the West, and mm. it was scandalous. You know, it was um, free, it, um, in a way. It in, yeah, um, it was at the time. In a way, it looks incredibly tame now, but it was mm. but it was scandalous at the time because it helped people move outside their traditional norms. Yep. Um, and I think the challenge we've got now is that sort of everything is possible. So then what has meaning? What's meaningful? So 
traditional branding where you go in and you tell people um, this is the way you should dress this is the way that you should mm. think this is the way you should act that kind of feels like just another noise amongst many other noises um, and and who the hell are you to tell me who I am um, so I think that the, the marketing has to change and by the way I think that's true you know some people might say well this is all true for consumer marketing if I'm doing fashion or I'm doing fast food I can see what you're saying makes sense here but does it apply to marketing business to business products um, that are around um, I don't know monoclonal antibodies in the life sciences or something and yeah. I think the answer there is that there are communities just as much if you're marketing to a community of people who are buying something very very technical for yeah. example then they have their own culture <clears throat> and and the and the products that are brought into that disrupt that culture in exactly the same way there are existing sort of powerful corporations that control one area of industry and when a new technology comes along it disrupts it so mm -hmm. what i'm saying doesn't just apply to um consumer, consumer products i think it applies yeah. to business to business products too it makes sense because we're talking about language here we're talking about when you are talking about deep tech the expertise mm -hmm. level of the language of who's communicating will indicate to the other if I trust or not. So all the same things apply yes. overall and in terms of- and we, might about... and we might pretend that a purchasing decision is very scientific and yeah. all based on criteria. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, do I trust these guys or not? You know, Can if I'm gonna put to this new product, yeah. I make rechargeable batteries. This company has an interesting new technology that could mm -hmm. make my batteries four times better but there is some risk because I've never tried it before. So do I trust them? So I think again, it's about that. It's, it's about exactly the same human emotional dynamic. Um, From 300,000 years ago. Yeah. 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 We and still have paleolithic emotions, you know? Uh, you gave me the best quote ever to define <laughs> the what we do to build community. And I'm going to quote it the way I do so that you can correct me <laughs> and sure. share it in your own words. But you said that community building is like, uh, you were talking about GFDI and accelerator programs at the time. And we were at, the, at MAGIC, the Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center, hosting mm -hmm. an event. And you said community building is really like the turkey in the Thanksgiving dinner. Like we get together to eat the turkey, but what really matters are the conversations around the table, like the people uh, connecting and the space between. So can you tell me more about, has it changed? <laughs> what do you think <laughs> builds community? If you want to start a community from scratch, what's the next I, steps? Well, thank you for, I'm glad that's been helpful to you. And um, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the idea came from me really from observing that often here in Singapore, I think people mm -hmm. are trained. My son's been through the local education system. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the education system <clears throat> works so well here is that they try to break everything down into repeatable processes and to look at the mm -hmm. ingredients and then mm -hmm. to do that in a repeatable way. Yeah. So it's a bit like saying, you know, if I want to create a Thanksgiving dinner, what are the perfect nutritional ingredients for a Thanksgiving dinner? Mm -hmm. But having, you know, the perfect nutritionally balanced Thanksgiving dinner doesn't make the best Thanksgiving occasion. You know, Thanksgiving isn't really about the turkey. It's about what goes on around the table. And so I think often when people look at community building, they, they think, what, what are the things I have to do? How do I have to organize my community? And actually mm. both of those questions are the wrong question to ask. The first question to ask is why are people coming together? Why, yeah. should, why, why would people come together about this? When, if you're clear about why people are coming together, then, then how you should run things and what they should do is, becomes obvious. Yeah. But, um, and I think when often one of the challenges, for example, for brands creating community is that trying to create community is that fundamentally, why am I trying to create this community? Well, my boss would like to increase market share by 20%, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that doesn't matter to the community yeah. that only matters to you and your boss. Mm -hmm. So the problem is it's a fundamentally centralized view of looking at the world. Um, it's not about saying, what can we give? What can we create? Why would people come together around us? It's, mm. a, it's a view about saying, well, what do I want? And the guaranteed way to not have any friends and not to uh, have anyone gather around you in a community is to say, well, this is what I want. Screw the rest of you. you know, that yeah. doesn't work. And at the same time, we are the most connected that ever was, but we are the loneliest generation that ever existed. So 
there is a need I feel to just go back to that instinctive yeah. understanding that to belong, I need to first figure out how can I add value, not how, what yes. can I get. What can I take? Yeah. I couldn't agree more with you. And I once heard a definition of, of, of sort of family and, it, and, and someone said to me, children are like um, putty, you know, and Play-Doh. They mm. come into a family and they look for a crack in the family. So if there is no kind of naughty brother or sister, then, then maybe that's my role. <laughs> or if there is kind of no hardworking, achieve all the exam results one, then that's the one I do, you know? It's like, and that's why, of course, those sitcoms like Friends, and, and it's a very mm -hmm. old show now, but there are, sitcoms have those sort of very traditional roles. There's the cheeky one, there's the kind of controversial one, there's the kind of hardworking, diligent, sensible one. People have these sort of scripted positions that they're trying to find. And I think many of us, when we come into the many, many communities that we now have to be part of, mm. we don't have a script. We don't know what to do. And so, as you say, the weird thing is we're sort of connected, but we're not, um, we don't know what role to play. So most people's sense when they get access to YouTube and they see other people blogging and they see other people doing YouTube is, I'm going to talk about me and the people are going to gather around me. And, and that's a very childlike way of looking at the world. Mm. A much more powerful way of looking at the world is saying, who are there out there that's looking to come together who yeah. I, that I can help bring together, that I can help articulate a need and to feel a sense of belonging. If you can create belonging for people, they'll come back and they'll come back and they'll love you forever. As you said, everything's possible right now. Well, there's more, I don't know, I think they say, don't they? Psychologists will say that we're sort of, a bit of us comes from nature, from our genes, and a bit of us comes from nurture, from our mm -hmm. community that we grow up mm -hmm. in. If it turns out that you're one of those people who doesn't fit in the village, you don't because you are gay, because mm -hmm. you are whatever, disabled, whatever reason is that you don't fit in, maybe the, the opportunity of the current world is that you can fit in wherever. Yeah. You know, there's that old cartoon from the internet that on the internet no one knows you're a dog you know um <laughs> there's that every, everyone yeah. has a chance to fit in but yeah. the, but the problem is there are so many communities then how to explore those communities and how to find people that i can trust and belong with um it's, and it's, especially when the unfortunate side of online communication is that it it has some things that that you couldn't do in the old world so if you lived in a village a traditional mm. village you can't ghost on people you can't just sort of, you know, I'm going to go on Tinder and, and, and hook up with this person and then I'm going to ghost on them. You can't do that because you're living in a village together. You have to yeah. live with the consequences of your actions. So one of the problems of, of you know, modern mm -hmm. community is that you can start a, a very meaningful, you can create a very meaningful sense of belonging with someone and then sort of they disappear and then you think, oh, and when that's happened several times, um, then it ends up actually feeling you wish, well, I'd, nev I'd never had that in the first place because I... I, who can I trust? Who who will be there? What will be permanent? What will be definite? So it's the sort of dilemma of choice, really. We've now got yeah. so many choices of places that we might belong. Um, yeah. We have to sort of try them all out. We come from a scarcity mentality. You know, we used yeah. food was scarce in the past. The ability to talk to strangers was scarce. So if a stranger came to town, you talk to them, you'd be really interested. Now there are strangers everywhere. With, there's yeah. no, but we still have a scarcity mentality when it comes to human relationships. So, for example, you know, we browse all the time on Twitter. We read loads mm. of crap from people that we don't really care about. One in a hundred tweets is actually interesting, but we waste loads of time scrolling through because we think that the next tweet might be interesting. In the same way, when we're part of every community, we you know, we, we join all these communities all this time, and mm. we don't really make any commitment to any of them. So we've got this weird thing that because we have a scarcity mentality. We, we look for optionality. We always look for the ability to, well, I might do this. I might do that. I might, you know, I'll do a prenup. I'm not really going to get married. I'm going to have a prenuptial agreement. Yeah. You know, I might kind of skip out later on. We're, and because we don't commit, we don't, we don't belong. But that's and, the opposite, the irony right? is, Then we're lonely. Yeah. yeah, and then we're lonely. There, that, so there's no coincidence there. Yeah. The, curi the curious thing is, in order to belong, you have to give up freedom. You have to make yourself vulnerable. Uh, Brene Brown has a wonderful yes. series of TED Talks about vulnerability. Absolutely. Being in a community and, and belonging is about making yourself vulnerable and living with the consequences of your actions. And um, yeah. And I think I mean, there's an image that's just come to me as we're, yeah. as we're talking, which is that I think nowadays we're all like children growing up in a war zone. 
if, if you grow up in a very stable society yeah. where there is a, a king or a queen or a president that you mm -hmm. respect and everything is in order, that gives you a huge sense of security when you're a child. Yeah. As you get older, you discover that life is more complicated and that maybe those people aren't as perfect as you thought. But at least there is something to aspire to, something that you might belong to one day, you know, mm -hmm. that's good and permanent and true. Nowadays, we have presidents who are behaving appallingly, who lie all the time. We have, um, it, it, it's as if we're children born into a war zone where we, 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 we can't trust anybody. Mm. So we don't trust anybody. So we're kind of traumatized. Um, to me, you know, one of the things that my wife and I have tried to give our son is, is some sense of unconditional love. You know, he belongs with us. Mm -hmm. well, we'd rather he doesn't murder anybody or, you know, whatever, there's a bunch of things. But, but he belongs to us fundamentally. Um, and that's, that's the security you want to give him as long as we're, one of us is alive. Yeah. Um, and I think that we're all looking for that deep down, you know, uh, in all the acting out, all the bad behavior you see is basically because people have lost love or they lack love. And, and so love is also a huge part of community. It, it, it it, is. It's about it, belonging. I don't mean erotic yeah. love. I don't mean romantic love. I mean belonging. I understand. And also the fact that we also live in a world where the consequences of the way we think today is that we're never enough. So we consume, yeah. we're never enough. So we do something about it. We're never enough. So we act. And in that, that implies conditional love, mm -hmm. which is not love at all. So and, and if only I find the right community that will give me a badge, you know, if only I go to Harvard and I get that degree, if yeah. only I work for Google and I've worked for that, if only I work for McKinsey, if only I've done a startup, if there's a whole series of things that we tell ourselves, you know, I, I'm not worthy until I've done this thing. And, and a lot of communities, you know, exploit that. A lot of brands yeah. exploit that, you know, and that's, that's the whole point of an elite brand. It's yeah. that some people get in and some people don't get in. All business schools sell themselves on that basis. They're all communities around a business school and they're all selling themselves by saying, you're a special person because you got through the door. It's not what we teach. <laughs> there is the Cool Kids Club. And Brenda Brown herself says about there's a difference between fitting in and belonging. In belonging, right. it is community. It is the sense of home. Whereas fitting in is about mean girls and clueless. Yeah. <laughs> and all the high school movies. And, and that's not exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's the cool And that's not club. authentic. And that's, car that's one so side true. is scarcity driven, the other is abundance. And there's a response, I totally agree with all you said. I think there's a responsibility yeah. that comes with it as well, that whenever you set up any kind of community, you are going to get, if it works, people are going to be authentic and you're going to get some quite complex and difficult discussions sometimes. Yeah. I think of that in a positive way. You know, my father died at the end of last year. He, um, mm. he was 92, he had a good life and, and he didn't suffer for very long at the end. Um, but his passion for the last 20, 30 years of his life was alpine plants. He grew these mm. tiny little plants, <laughs> snowdrops, um, which people are obsessive about. They will pay hundreds of dollars for a single plant. And my father was extremely good at growing these very specialized plants. And at the end of his life, um, you know, we, we had his funeral and mm. most of the people who came to the funeral were from his snowdrop friends. They were, he belonged to this community of people who are obsessed with these plants. <laughs> and wow. and um, it was really fascinating to discover this, you know, how much my father had meant to that community. These were mm. people who traveled a long distance to be at his funeral. And I realized that although they'd come together for one reason, which was about growing these little plants and sharing yeah. the technology, the technical know-how, how to do it. Really why they were together as a community is because they found a place they, where they belong. And there was such a diverse group of people in terms of um, their age and their backgrounds and everything else. I think your, yeah. your father's example was the perfect Turkey example. Mm. Like those plants were initially just the excuse to yeah. bring people together. Yes, they are. They're exactly something. like a turkey. You're right. And in a nutshell, right. it's about building relationships, not transactions. Yes. And yeah. thinking about it, about how yeah. can we be a, be a turkey or create turkeys and know the deeper reason is often not seen. Yes. It's often not the one we communicate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm looking forward to um, being part of the community that you're building around community building. I yes. forget the name of it now. It's, it's called Hacking Communities? Or? Yes, it's called Hacking Communities. Um, in fact, I thought about changing the name so many times for something that communicated <laughs> better. But again, Hacking Communities is only the turkey. So yeah. <laughs> we yeah. have a different way. Yeah. I'm very glad to have you in. Thank you so much for your time.